One of the things that can be difficult with respect to people who have acute pain uh, is not thinking about the possible one month, two month, and three month out situation. Uh, most of us are very quick to think about a person's got something going on, I've done this a thousand times before, I've seen it a thousand times before, and I'm going to use empirically what has worked 997 times before. And every so often, despite what we see, patients go off on that track. And that track sort of deviates from the norm, which would be acute pain, healing, resolution of pain. And it's very easy to try and take a ruler and measure up the acute pain patient, maybe someone who's been in an automobile accident and had surgery, something like that, and then use a cookbook kind of formula, treat them, and gauge all of their progress by a reduction in their pain score. I call that a reductionistic approach. Nowhere in this discussion have I mentioned the other sphere that is spinning around at the same time, which is the psychosocial aspect. What was happening to the patient before this acute pain happened? What's going to be happening to them while it's going on? And what's going to happen to them from a psychosocial perspective if the acute pain doesn't necessarily resolve? What it really sets the stage for is this subacute period, which we don't hear a lot of discussion about. It's sort of like cancer pain or non-cancer pain. And there's a very large group of people who are cancer pain survivors, and I would say that the subacute pain patient perspective is sort of that often unused classification. Those patients in that subacute period, sometimes between one month and 90 days, less than a month being acute, 90 days or longer being chronic, that middle 60 days is probably the time at which they have the opportunity to or not to transition from acute to chronic pain. And I think we all need to give a little bit more credence to that sphere of psychosocial influences and also see that middle subacute period as our best opportunity to try and make a dent. And in the people who we don't win the battle, who go on to experience that chronic pain, maybe we call for help a little bit sooner rather than later, because the longer it goes on, the better the human body is at adapting to that scenario and the tougher it could be to treat. When we think about the integration of the biopsychosocial model to the biomedical model, I think we all fall into the pitfall of thinking that multimodal approaches all refer to the biomedical model. Use massage, use medication, use other aspects of medical treatment. We need to do a lot of fact finding and a lot of digging to see if there are things about the person that may influence them that we're really not necessarily aware of. I think there are things that people in primary care can do to for forestall the transition from acute to chronic pain. And one of those things is actually asking the patient how they're doing outside of the envelope of their pain. There's everything else about the person that's going on. Work, social influences, sleep, appetite, function. I would love for success of pain treatment at a primary care level. I would love for the definition of pain treatment to be redefined as the negotiation of pain and function. And I think the primary care clinician is the best suited because presumably they know the patient better than anybody else. Certainly way better than a consultant will know. So it's all about context.